Good evening, everybody. Uh, sorry for the delays. Had a couple little technical difficulties to, to begin the meeting, so apologies for that. Uh, my name is Mark Baltzell. I'm the statewide salmon and steelhead manager for the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, we're here tonight to go through the Willapa Bay and Grays Harbor forecasts for this year. Uh, this is kind of the initial kickoff. We're going to have our big kickoff meeting tomorrow, uh, where we'll do a little bit deeper dive into forecasts and some climate variables and other things. So welcome, everybody. Really happy to have everybody here this evening. Um, for those of you who are joining by phone, uh, I, we, when we take questions, uh, you'll have uh, the raise hand feature. And please, our, our, um, our kind of administrator tonight, Leah Snyder, if I say something wrong, please help me out. I, I believe uh, the raise hand feature is star six. And the uh, uh, to mute and unmute yourself is star nine. Did I get that right? That is opposite. Thank you. So it's star six to mute and unmute yourself and star nine to raise your hand. Thank you, Leah. Um, we're going to go ahead and kick off now. Um, sorry, another little technical glitch. Everybody still see the presentation okay? Yeah, it looks good. Um, we Thanks, see your Jake. slide sorter on the left there. Mark. Yeah, it, it's not, it's back out of presentation view, Mark. Sorry about that, everybody. There we go. Uh, we're going to, here's a little overview for tonight. Uh, we're going to do some staff introductions and talk about the meeting, a uh, little bit of the North of Falcon process. Uh, we're going to go through our rulemaking process and how that fits in with North of Falcon. Uh, we're going to dig into the forecasts and management objectives for this year uh, for both Willapa Bay and Grays Harbor. And then we're going to just touch on some of the other North Coast salmon forecasts uh, uh, that we're looking at this year that um, will likely um, contribute to how we're shaping fisheries this year. So again, uh, I'm uh, Mark Baltzell. I'm the statewide salmon and steelhead manager. Uh, also with us tonight is Kyle Attix. He's our intergovernmental salmon manager. And then we have a, a new lead in Willapa, Grace Harbor, uh, Marlene Wagner, who I know she's communicated with uh, many of you uh, already. Uh, many of you also know our, our um, structure within our agency. It's, it's somewhat uh, regionalized and somewhat centralized. Uh, the people on the left side of the screen there are uh, folks that are kind of part of the centralized part of our agency uh, out of Olympia. Uh, then we also have our regional staff, our, our boots on the ground, the people who you're most familiar with. Uh, regional Director uh, Larry Phillips uh, is um, oversees uh, the director's office from Region 6. Um, James Losey, uh, the regional program manager, is also on with us this evening. Um, Mike Scharf, who covers Grays Harbor, and Jody Pope, who cover Willapa. Uh, Rob Allen covers our hatchery operations. And then Kurt Holt and Kim Figler Barnes uh, cover the Grays Harbor area. And Barb McClellan and Lyle Jennings cover the Willapa Basin. So uh, many of you are very familiar with our processes. We're here tonight to kick off the North of Falcon process. Uh, obviously, this is your uh, one of your uh, several of opportunities to provide meaningful input for us uh, and help guide our decision making as we go through this preseason process and try to implement fisheries. Obviously, we're here to answer all the questions and share all the information we have as we're planning these fisheries. And uh, the main reason we're here is to list, uh, solicit your input uh, for fishery suggestions. So uh, with that, thank you. I'm going to kick it over to Marlene, and she's going to take us through the next section. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, so I'll start off by giving you just sort of an overview of fisheries management um, for salmon uh, on this side of the North Pacific. Because salmon swim across international borders, salmon fishery planning happens at a lot of different scales and jurisdictional levels. So um, over here on the left, uh, the Pacific Salmon Commission, it's a treaty-based uh, international organization that serves as a decision-making body for the cooperative management of Pacific salmon. 
The Pacific Salmon Treaty sets limits on catch and interceptions of salmon from Southeast Alaska to the Southern United States, covers the whole outside area out in international waters. As quotas are set for those fisheries each year, those catchers, catches must be factored in as they affect numbers of fishes uh, returning to our fisheries here in Washington. Outside that, we have uh, the Pacific Fisheries Management Council who are responsible for fisheries in the economic exclusion zone from three miles to 200 miles offshore. Then on the inside, we have tribes, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Fisheries and inside waters are planned through this North of Falcon process and also under the legal framework of US v. Washington and US v. Oregon. Next slide, please. So this slide, it just provides a brief overview of the North Falcon process in a, in, a, in a nutshell, a really small nutshell, like a pistachio nut. Uh, we start with forecasting the abundances of each stock. And, and from there, we can determine if there is a harvestable surplus. Once we have determined what that harvestable surplus is, we can model fisheries to determine which stocks are going to be the constraining stocks. We predict what we will catch under different fishing scenarios and then negotiate with our tribal co-managers if needed. For example, we have co-managers here in Grace Harbor, but not in Willapa Bay, and also other states for sharing of catching stocks within those constraints. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, this is the North of Falcon public meeting schedule, uh, especially with respect to sort of our region. Um, of course, this year with uh, the limitations COVID-19 has put on us, all meetings will be held virtually. Um, you should be able to click on each of these links and it will take you to each of these meetings I'm about to describe. Um, if you prefer to join meetings on your phone, um, after you click the link, you will also see instructions to be able to do that. Um, so, of course, here we are on February 25th at our Willapa Bay and Grace Harbor forecast kickoff meeting. Um, and then tomorrow on February 26th, we have statewide salmon forecast and fishing opportunities meeting uh, from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. There will be quite a lot of detailed information presented here, um, especially about ocean conditions and how they are affecting stocks. So definitely tune in if that is of interest to you. The department will also present Puget Sound, Coastal Washington, and Columbia River salmon abundance forecasts, and also fisheries management objectives and preliminary fishing opportunities. This is also going to be live streamed on TVW, so you can tune in there as well. Next on the agenda is the first of this year's Pacific Fishery Management Council meetings on March 2nd to the 5th and March 8th to the 11th. Uh, and you can view the meeting agenda and uh, at that link. Next for us here is the first North of Falcon meeting on March 16th, where there will be um, discussion of management objectives and preliminary fishery proposals for both sport and commercial fisheries in coastal Washington, um, as well as Puget Sound and some discussion of Columbia River and ocean fisheries. After that, we have the North of Falcon Willapa Bay fisheries discussion meeting on March 17th. There uh, we'll have more detailed information and discussion about what fisheries might look like with our ocean uh, options um, in, in order to start narrowing down on our terminal options. On March 23rd, there's a Pacific Fisheries Management Council ocean public hearing where ocean options are discussed that come out of the first meeting. After that, um, next slide, please. We have the North of Falcon Grace Harbor fisheries discussion on March 24th, where again, like the Willapa Bay meeting on the 17th, we will have more detailed discussion about what fisheries are shaping up to be um, with our ocean options and to be able to begin narrowing down on our terminal options. Next on April 5th is uh, Did I skip North of Falcon? Pardon me. On April 5th, we have our Willapa Bay, our second Willapa Bay fisheries discussion. 
Um, and that'll be focused on developing the fisheries further, fine tuning the fisheries and, and narrowing down what Washington fisheries are gonna look like. April 6th, uh, we're gonna follow up, excuse me, that was our second North of Falcon meeting on March 31st. On April 5th and 6th, um, we're gonna follow up again with our regional meetings with the public for both Willapa Bay and Grace Harbor. And everything is gonna culminate at um, the Pacific Fishery Management Council meeting too. Um, we'll narrow down on ocean options or the council will rather and uh, get a proposed fishery package where we can start to move through the formal rulemaking or Administrative Procedures Act process or APA. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to our in-house expert, uh, Mr. Kyle Addix to describe this process. Thank you, Marlene. Um, so as Marlene ran you through the North of Falcon schedule, as we um, close in on seasons and start to set fishing seasons and regulations for the upcoming year, we also go through a formal rulemaking process under the Administrative Procedure Act. Um, the process for this year actually started back in January when we filed what's called a CR 101, a code reviser form that is a notice to the public that we're about to undertake rulemaking. Um, those were filed back in January, one for recreational fisheries around the state and one specific for Willapa Bay and Grays Harbor commercial fisheries. And the rest of this is just the generic APA process, so we don't have the dates all filled in yet, but after a minimum of 45 days after that initial filing, we can file a CR 102, which is the actual proposed rules that we are considering adopting. From there, we um, have another public hearing and we take written comments on the proposed rules and consider making modification to those proposed rules based on either comments that we received or any errors that we identified that were in the, the proposed rules in the um, CR 102. And from there, we go to um, a CR 103P and concise explanatory statement filing. The CR 103P is the actual rule that's being adopted that the director will review and consider adopting. That gets published to the Washington State Register after 14 days and the rule becomes effective 31 days after filing of, filing of that final CR 103P. Um, with the North of Falcon process between the filing of the 101 in January and that 102 filing that will happen later, we have a, a very large public process and if next slide mark, the North of Falcon process. So this is where we take most of our public input. We hold this long string of meetings that Marlene um, showed you the schedule for. As we move towards filing the proposed regulations and the 102, we've already gone through this big public process that those, those rules are as, we hope as close to the final rules as they can be. Um, although we still do take additional comment and uh, have a public hearing to consider changes to those. So that's the, the quick summary of the APA process and how the North of Falcon process fits into it. And with that, I believe I'm passing it off to Jody Pope. Thanks, Kyle, for that. So I'm gonna get us kicked off here. Um, as you can see here, there's a lot of information on this slide. Um, so I'm gonna quickly walk you through it. Um, so here we're looking at a table of forecasts and this describes the forecasted number of adults returning back to Willapa Bay. For Willapa Bay, we have three major species that we forecast, Chinook, Coho, and Chum. And we also have natural origin and hatchery origin. And to the far left, you can see that there's a total um, of all the fish returning to the bay. Under the table, you can see uh, a statement goals listed for each one of those major species in the table above. A reminder for folks that the statement goals are an estimated number of adults that will make it back to the spawning grounds. So for example here, if you look, for, look at Chinook, we have forecasted 3,924 natural origin Chinook to return, 30,470 hatchery fish, for a total of 34,394. You can also see that before fisheries even begin, um, we are below our statement goal for Chinook. It's also important to note here that for COHO, uh, this data is preliminary as we're still just uh, concluded our COHO surveying. 
So these numbers are likely to change um, moving forward as we finalize, um, finalize those uh, values there. Um, so it's easiest to understand this table if we look at trends of the past years related to current forecast in graphs. So if I could have the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, again here, I'm gonna walk you through this. Again, there's a lot going on in this slide, but as you can see, there's three different graphs and each one represents a different species. So on the left, we have Chinook. On the top right, we have Coho and Chum. On the bottom axis, we have the year from 2010 to 20, 2021. On the Y axis, we have the total natural origin run size. And the dotted line uh, between year 2014 and 2015 is where uh, Willapa Bay policy implementation took place. And the red dot is where we are sitting today. So if we take a look at Chinook, we can see that the trends are variable over time with a light downward trend. But most recently, we're seeing a slight uptick in the run size if we look from 2018 until now. For Coho, the orientation is the same year on the bottom and total natural origin run size on the y axis with the dotted line and the red dot. All of these are exactly the same, uh, orientated the same way. Um, and again, we see run, si run size over time very variable, but most recently, we've been in this very low run size situation the last several years. Um, and what this means is that it will be yet another challenging year for Coho uh, in Willapa Bay. Uh, we will need to rely heavily uh, in our, using our end season tools to make, to, make uh, to inform our management decisions and to track where we are throughout the season. If we take a look at CHUM, we again see some variability among the years but overall, the trends seem to be remaining fairly stable over time. However, recent trends may suggest a slight decline in run size. And with that, I'm gonna kick it off to Mike. Hello all, hopefully I've uh, pulled up on the screen over there. Um, I'm Mike Scharf, the District Bio for Grays Harbor. Um, I'm going to run through the forecasts for the Grays Harbor Basin. Um, I'll just run them through real quick on the first slide. We have Spring Chinook, Fall Chinook, and Coho. Um, Spring Chinook, we have a forecast of just a little bit over a thousand fish returning. Uh, for Fall Chinook, our, our forecast is for uh, 10,852 natural origin fish and 1862 hatchery origin fish. And for coho, the numbers I'm presenting here are in what we call an ocean aged three abundance. And these, this is a, the forecasted abundance of adult fish out in the ocean before um, the North of Falcon and the uh, fishery management process begins and we set our seasons. So these are not fish that will return terminally. We'll figure that out once we get to the PFMC2 meeting. Uh, but um, historically, based on Code of Water tags, it's, it's somewhere about eight, seven percent of these um, of these fish will be removed in fisheries uh, that are pre-terminal. So with that said, uh, we've got a forecast of 42,324 natural origin and 23,800 uh, hatchery origin fish. And uh, next slide, uh, to kind of bring these into context, uh, last year we had a forecast of Spring Chinook of about 1,200. And uh, we saw quite a few fish come back. Um, there's a little bit of caution in that number you'll see in 2002 on the graph, um, more than 2000 uh, escaped to the spawning grounds. Uh, a lot of those fish occurred in the skookum chuck and there is some concern that the artificial flow regime that's created through the operation of the dam may have brought in some uh, fall Chinook uh, a little early. Um, we are working with the uh, <clears throat> dam operator to 
uh, to see if <clears throat> we can alter flows there to get it back to a more natural regime. But Spring Chinook performed a little bit better than our forecast, um, which is a good thing. Um, switching to Fall Chinook, <clears throat> we also had a, a uh, better return than we did uh, in our forecast. <clears throat> Excuse me. We had a forecast last year of uh, about 11,000 11, natural origin. And uh, the return to the basin was about 16,000. Our forecast this year is about 10,000. And if you wonder why it's a little bit lower, um, a lot of the four and five-year-olds are coming off those smaller returns of 2016 and 2017. <clears throat> so hopefully we'll see in future years that that'll go up. But one thing is nice to show here is that we've had a decent return of our fall Chinook the last three years. Um, Coho is, is a lot like what we saw at Wilka Bay. Uh, we, we've seen this decline since 2015. We had a forecast of about 40,000 natural origin fish last year. Um, we don't have our escapements done for 2020, so we can't really compare it. But um, our return in 2019 was about 26 to 27,000, so a little bit low. Um, and 2020, based on the reds that we've seen so far this season, is going to be in about the same range. So our forecast has been a little bit higher than what we're seeing actually come back. Um, so th those are some kind of comparisons to the Shayla Space and forecast versus um, what we're seeing recently. So uh, now moving to uh, hump tulips. Next slide. Uh, our forecast for 2021. Uh, for Fall Chinook is 44,668 uh, natural origin and 5,696 uh, hatchery origin. A little, little bit above last year. Um, for Coho, again, this is an ocean, ocean, ocean aged abundance. Uh, for natural Coho, it's 2,519, sorry. And for hatchery origin, it's uh, 7,874. Um, that 2,519 is far below the goal of 6,800. So we're still uh, have issues there in the hump tulips for coal. And now for Grace Harbor Chum, we have a forecast of 40,138 of natural origin fish and 2,110 of um, Atrio organ fish. So how, how do these compare to last year? Next slide. Um, very similar to um, what we've seen at Willapa Bay. Um, we've got a little bit, uh, a big decline in our coho and, and we've known this for a lot of years. So that, that's gonna be one of our issues. Um, Fall Chinook uh, kind of been on a downward trend, but we've seen that turn around a little bit. Um, our forecast last year was uh, 3857, uh, and it looks like um, our, our uh, escapement uh, that came back was a little bit above that uh, forecast number. So there's a little bit of positive there on our hump tulips. Um, Fall Chinook uh, for Grace Harbor. Chum, um, we, we've seen a pretty steady uh, return of about 30 to 40,000 fish coming back. Uh, our forecast was 32,000 last year, uh, and our return was um, uh, over 330. And that was about, it, it should be in the, the 40,000 range. So um, our, our, co, our chum sh is are performing. Uh, pretty consistently in the last several years. Um, and in our last group of slides for my area, the Queets, uh, next slide. Um, <clears throat> again, we have Queets and Quinault River uh, coho numbers. Again, these are ocean abundance uh, estimates or forecasts. Um, 15,000 natural origin uh, Quinault River Coho with 24,645 hatchery origin. Those are pretty uh, consistent numbers across the board. Queets, the natural origin 
um, forecast is 3,919 and 11,780 in the hatchery uh, forecast. That wild forecast is an extremely low number. So there is going to be a big concern with all our fisheries with that lower turn. I think with that, I am done. What's the next slide? Oh, recent trends. Sorry, I didn't know that that was there. Um, so as I was speaking, you can see that um, Queets Coho, uh, the wild portion of the Queets Coho has not been performing very well um, in a number of years, particularly since 2015. Um, and, and a lot of you have understood that we've lost some of our opportunity there and, and th things aren't getting better. Um, good news is that the Quinault coho seem to be doing pretty good. So um, forecast is a little bit lower than the previous few years, but um, it's been fairly steady over the years. And I think I am done now. Oh, no, I'm not. Management objectives. I get to move right into that. So with all of that being said, what do we got to look forward to this fall? Um, with a, a forecast for spring Chinook below the goal, um, probably not gonna be targeting those in any fisheries uh, coming this summer. <clears throat> uh, we've had a few years of pretty low returns and, and a couple of years of rebounds. Probably best to be a little conservative with the stock. Hump Tulips Coho, uh, for 20 years, we've been below goal. Um, we're going to be um, crafting our fisheries to uh, keep our, our WDFW impacts under 5%. Um, Chehalis coho, uh, we haven't made the goal three out of five years. Um, and, and so that puts us into a, a management uh, regime of looking at keeping our impacts under 5%. And I will also bring up that under the Pacific Salmon Treaty, the forecasted abundance is falls within the moderate abundance category, but at the low end. And if many of you remember 2018, we were in a low abundance category and we had a maximum exploitation rate of 20%. This year, it's going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of about 22.2% with Canada having the opportunity to take up to eight point, I think 4%, but don't quote me on those numbers, but it, it's in that general category. So um, th there's gonna be some struggles in getting um, fisheries pieced together with some of those limitations. Um, if, if we look on the bright side, uh, chum are looking pretty good. Um, we've made our goal for spring or uh, fall Chinook in the Chehalis three out of the past five years, which is the first time. Uh, actually, I think we did it last year, but uh, our, our numbers are looking pretty good um, for our Chinook population. So. Um, that, that's what we have to look forward to. And with that, I think I can finally pass it back to Jody. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> yeah, in uh, Willapa Bay, so uh, our management objectives for 2021, folks will remember that for the past several years since policy impl implementation, um, we've had guidance to follow a 20% impact rate for both Willapa and Nacelle rivers. Uh, in 2019, we were given guidance to move to a 14% impact rate. And we expect to receive guidance at our commission meeting that will be held uh, this Saturday at 8 a.m. for what our 2021 objective will be for Chinook. Uh, for CHUM, we're pretty excited about our numbers of CHUM. Um, we have achieved our statement goal three out of the last five years. So essentially, uh, we'll be out of the penalty box, if you will. Um, so unless we receive different guidance from the commission, we will manage to the escapement goal for CHUM. And for COHO, um, in past years, we've managed to the escapement goal. And similar to the other species listed here, uh, we'll wait to receive guidance from the commission on what we'll manage this fishery to in 2021. So more to come on that after uh, Saturday's um, commission meeting. So if you're interested in hearing that, please tune in to, to that meeting Saturday morning. And this now concludes our presentation. Are there any other DFW staff that would like to add anything before we open it up for questions?
Great. Thanks, Jody. Uh, really appreciate uh, Mike and Jody running us through those forecasts. Um, this, uh, I, this is the, the point where we're going to take questions. Uh, Leah Snyder, who's a, a department support person, uh, is here to help guide us through that. Um, uh, we brought our team together to be able to uh, answer everybody's questions. As as you all well know, there's there's several of us who are kind of new to the basin and, and learning on the go. So uh, we've assembled a team of experts here to help guide us through your questions tonight. So with that, I might ask Leah if she can identify the first question for us. And the first question is Lance Gray. Lance. I have allowed you to talk, but you may need to unmute yourself. Okay, am I on there? Yes, Lance, go ahead. Hey, um, I was wondering when I when I look at these escapement goals and stuff, when we put these graphs up there, this, and this was just kind of a question for myself. Um, would it be possible to put the predictions that we had in years past in a red line or something so we can see where we you know, we predicted, we, we basically look at a graph that says this is what came back and not looking at what we predicted so we can see how we're doing, I guess, prediction wise to what the runs are doing in, in future. We, we've done it before. And I just was wondering if that was something we could go back to, to show, you know, show how accurate or how we're doing on our predictions versus what actually came back. Maybe I'll just take a first stab and if other uh, staff want to hop in. Uh, Lance, thanks for that. I, I'm sure if it's something that we've done in the past, then uh, we can put our head, collective heads together and and kind of do a redo on that and distribute it to the to the distribution. So um, so you have that. Um, and if I misspoke, please somebody uh, step up and tell me you're wrong, Mark. Yeah, I might add in something. I, I won't say you're wrong, Mark. But uh, one thing, Lance, so that's a great suggestion and that's, that's pretty easy to do. Jody and Barb have great accounting of how we've done in Willapa Bay and Mike Scharf has, you know, of course been the district bio for a number of years. So those data are available. Um, just since I know you, you've been around too and you understand this process. Um, one important part about this forecasting is uh, each year we hope we get better at forecasting than the previous. So we look at a range of options for forecasting, like a bunch of different tools we could use. And so uh, this forecasting method specifically for Chinook in Willapa Bay can change through time. So one thing I would suggest, and maybe we talk about it offline is um, we do this, we look at all these different tools and we look back in time and, and ask the question, had we used this tool in the past, how well would it have performed? And then we choose among all these different tools, which one will would have performed best over time. So um, one thing that I think might be helpful, maybe even better than seeing how poor or good we've done in the past is looking at the tools yeah. Jody used Jody. in Ulpa Bay this year and showing um, our forecast performance using those tools in the past. Um, does that make sense, Lance? Yeah, no, I, I yeah, I just, it, it's, it's hard for, you know, I know you, you spoke to it tonight a little bit where you said, you know, this is what we forecast this is where it came, you know, it came in and we're forecasting this for, but it doesn't show the graph just, just for me, I'm more of a visual person. I guess I like to see, you know, we, we, we forecasted 15,000 of Chinook and it came back at 30,000 or, you know, you know what I'm just, just so I can look at where it is, you know, but yeah, nope. Sounds good. Yeah, those data are handy. So we, we use, you know, the term forecast performance and Jody's done all that work. So um, we can we can just share that with you here in the coming weeks so you can look at it and with others too. Okay, thank you. Hey, if I can, uh, Lance, Ron Warren, uh, on Saturdays or at Saturday's commission presentation, we don't do it in the line graph like you're describing, but we do show a comparison of what was forecasted versus actual returns. Uh, for each of the species in Willapa in our presentation. So you'll be able to see it there. And that, that is available online uh, for the nine o'clock start time for the Willapa presentation on Saturday. Okay, thank you. Yep. And the next hand raise is Dave Hamilton. I have enabled you to talk. You may need to unmute yourself. 
can you hear me? Go ahead, Dave. Can you hear me? Go ahead, Dave. We can hear you. Oh, good. I got one question. Mike, on the uh, 2020 numbers not being in there for coho, uh, and we're in the 3-5, which I really wasn't aware of, but that means it doesn't mean nothing. Um, would though, if the 2020 numbers were in there, would that make a difference to the 3-5? Thanks for the question, Dave. Um, I don't think it would. Um, I would have to pull it up because um, we didn't make it last year. Actually, it would, but we, we won't have those numbers for quite a while. And I don't think we'd have them uh, by the end of our um, management process. We're still counting coho out there. The, the Quinaults are still counting coho out there. Um, and from what we've gathered so far, just relating uh, reds in our indexes to historical numbers, we're looking like uh, we're going to be at or just below uh, the, the goal again this year. Um, and I, I didn't put it up, but I think it's in one of the handouts. You'll see that it seems like we're on an every other year uh, coho cycle where we're meeting goal and then the next year we're not. Then we're meeting goal next year we're not. Um, but no, and, and we've never had these escapements uh, for coho ready at this time in the past. So this isn't something new, but yeah, it would be nice if we had those. I mean, the, the timing of our coho run through March a lot of times. And, and so it's very difficult to get those escapements done in a timely manner. Hope that helps. It does, but I have another question at the right same ahead. time. It's a bit of a follow-up. Uh, and I'll put it in writing to you. I have no problem when you guys have to restrict fisheries for conservation. That's a no brainer. But uh, the last few years, as you well aware, I washed it pretty good. Um, the thing that I've noticed is the way we do it, like last week, we had a two week down window and we've done that before. Well, what happens is if it rains early, or the fish are early, upstream might benefit. If it goes the other way downstream, the way you do it with a two week shutdown, somebody's gonna bear all the, uh, most of the burden of it. Just depends what the fish and the weather do. In other words, it's not an equ equitable way to do it for all terminal users. I would kind of suggest that we could look at something like the ocean does. In other words, last year we had to lose 14 days. Oh, okay, then let's just lose two days a week. Let's say sun, Sunday and Monday, all right? And that gives you your 14 days. And if the fish make a charge early, it doesn't really blow the, the, the bottom guys clear off the map or the, uh, either way around. In other words, it's just a more equitable way to ensure that the conservation burden is pretty well carried by everybody instead of whichever portion of the users happens to be have the bad luck to have the fish do it to them. Do you kind of understand what I'm saying? Uh, I certainly do. And hopefully I'm not overstepping somebody else's grounds, but uh, yeah, it sounds like if there are conservation closure needs that a two week block probably isn't the greatest thing. If we could space, extend that two week, block into a couple of days for a couple of months. Uh, that way, as you're saying, if all the fish come in during a particular week, um, there's still opportunity for some on those and we're still having the uh, benefits of some closure during that particular time. Well, the purpose of closure is to put more fish into the escapement. I, everybody understands that. Uh, last year was the poster child for how fish can put it to you uh, because I was, since I live on the river, I, I even text and emails and let everybody know that window came in and just at about the day it came in, the whole bloody run come up the river. Well, we thought it might be a bigger run, but in the end, uh, in conversation, information you were kind enough to provide and stuff, pretty doggone appearance. No, the run wasn't early. That was the run. Well, if you fish below Elma, 
you met the big dog. You lost the two weeks that the fish were there because the fishing was crappy after that. If you were inland, it was, the, it was a dream come true. The whole run was right there and you had access to them. Then it rained and they shot up farther and that made upland people happy. Uh, one of the tribal fishermen was getting scales not set coho <laughs> in, in the first week of, I mean, sec, uh, third week of October, which he, had, he is like unheard of. So I'm just simply saying is a shutdown window can benefit or hurt a different user. It can be tribal, uh, like Chehalis tribal or Quinault or Rec or whatever, even the bay. It just, the, the fish are gonna do and the weather is gonna do what it does. So I just suggesting instead of us trying to outguess all that, simply ensure that it's, it's done equitably. And like if we have to lose 18 days, all right, start to the front of that season. And you, Mike, you've done it, you run those numbers. Uh, you can look at, you've gotten so good at it, you can just about look at it and tell anybody whether to work or not before you even punch a key. So I'm just saying it, that this thing we're going through with fish, it's not going to go away. And I'm saying at this point in time, after the example of last year and other years where we've missed on the forecast and made it, there has to be a better way. They do it in the ocean. That's how they do it in the ocean. They limit the days to make the season stretch out. I'm just saying for terminal fisheries, we ought to do the same thing. I mean, it, that doesn't strike me as an unreasonable request. I, I've got you, Dave. Um, even in our preseason planning, if we could look at X number of days per week as opposed to a start two weeks later. Got it, got, got it noted. Thank you. Leah, is there another question? Yes, sorry, I rookie mistake and I was muted. Um, Ty Wyatt, I have allowed you to speak. Hey guys. Hey guys, Hi, thanks for the great presentation. Uh, I, have a, I have a couple questions. Um, one, I guess I would like to see the harvest per year with those escapement numbers. So um, to me, it looks like the escapements are really flat, but I'd love to see if they're flat because of both Northern intercept fisheries, uh, offshore fisheries off Washington and then um, inland fisheries uh, were, were plotted in there. So you could at least see um, the benefits of these closures. Who's going to take that one? <laughs> um, I guess nobody else is speaking up. I'll jump in. Um, are you looking for pre-terminal and terminal um, run sizes here? Is that what I'm, I, I think I understand what you're saying. Uh, and I, well, yeah, and I guess these, you know, these are the numbers in the graphs are actually the terminal run size, except for coho. Well, coho are too, which means it's terminal catch plus escapement. So, okay. so that piece is there. What we don't have are the the pre terminal, the ocean, the Canada, the Alaska numbers. Right. Yeah, I guess I guess it would it would look more comprehensive if you looked at it that way, assuming that those catch rates aren't flat like your escapement graphs are. That's, that's all it looked like to me. Um, certainly as we move through these meetings, because uh, we got a couple of more for each area uh, in the future, uh, we can prepare something like that for handouts at some of our upcoming meetings. Sure, thanks guys. And uh, this is James Losey again. Thanks, Mike, for taking that. And I, I would just add, Ty, um, if you want to discuss, you know, sort of further, you know, just your interest in how these catches are allocated, you know, each year, some of that information from just recent years, we could describe, you know, the history of, of who catches fish um, at these different marine areas and freshwater. And um, so those data are available, too, if you want to chat about it. 
Yeah, sure. I, I, I just wanted to see it uh, plotted out. And then, you know, when you guys go to the Chinook Technical Committee, perhaps you can give them and, and ask for less fish to be harvested. But that's just my thoughts. No, it makes sense, Ty. Yeah, good question. The next question was from Jessica Weigel. She wrote it in the Q&A. Um, she asked, when will the coho prediction be finalized and do you expect they will go up or down? Who measures escapement in the Chehalis Basin? Well, I heard Chehalis, so I guess that's me again. Um, I can address. Um, the numbers that were presented in this for forecasts, those numbers will be lower because they do not include the pre-terminal or the Ocean Canada, Alaska numbers. So we will get those numbers and hopefully they'll be finalized during the uh, PFMC two meetings, which were um, scheduled for, I think, April 16th, 15th is when they'll conclude. We'll have a pretty good idea prior to the, that point, um, but those numbers will go down. Um, like I said, on, on average, historically, uh, they'll go down about 7% is a good estimate. Um, as for escapements, that's part of my crew. Um, we conduct, along with some of the surveys that are done by the Quinault tribe, but uh, my crew, uh, we do our, the spawning ground surveys in the Shayless Hump Tulips Basin, and we are the ones that uh, do the uh, escapement estimates for all our salmon and steelhead stocks. Jessica, I have allowed you to unmute in case you have any other questions. Um, so when you say your team does the escapement measuring, so are those like biologists? Are they temporary hires? Are they like long-term, um, highly seasoned staff members? Or are they like, like, can you tell us more about who they are? Certainly. Um, we, we have a staff and, and as shown in the presentation, Kurt Holt is my stock assessment bio. He's been in the basin for over 40 years doing this type of work. So he has a lot of experience. Um, and we have a staff in, in the Shayless Basin. We actually have two, two crews going on right now. One's doing a specific uh, intensive survey in the New Wacom Basin. Uh, they have four um, we call them seasonal staff. They're all biologists. Uh, and then Kurt has four biologists, which are seasonal. All of the ones we have have many years worth of experience conducting spawning ground surveys. And they're typically hired in September. And some of them last through the steelhead season, which is in uh, ends in June. Uh, so I would say that our, our staff has lots of years of experience. And even if we have to, uh, it, there is turnover. And when we bring in new staff, uh, they are trained intensively. And like I said, Kurt's got over 40 years of stock assessment in the Chehalis Basin and, and really knows this stuff. So I would say that we have probably the highest class of knowledge and ability uh, that you can find. Thanks, Mike. And, and this is Mark. I, I really just want to add, you know, uh, uh, and echo what Mike said about Kurt. You know, uh, Kurt's trained a lot of our biologists over the years uh, to do this kind of work. And a lot of those biologists go to other parts of the agency. So uh, we feel really good about uh, kind of Kurt and that team out in Region 6 and the quality of their work. And looks like the next question is from Eric Williamson. I have allowed you to speak. You may need to unmute yourself. Hello there, thanks for taking my question. Um, my question in particular is for Grays Harbor Coho. Um, you had a slide up showing the projection and made the, one, the biologist made the statement that Grays Harbor Coho have missed their escapement goal three of the last five years. So we're potentially in the penalty. And 
made the comment that uh, seasons or fisheries might be tailored around a 5% impact instead of uh, managing for an escapement goal. My question is, as a wreck fisherman, uh, season-wise, could we be looking, what's, what, what season we get, could we be looking at a quota fishery instead of a set date fishery, if that makes sense? Because of that 5% impact? Yeah, I can address that. Um, I, I will not say that we would do a quota. All of our management in Grace Harbor are based on harvest rate estimates. And, and so basically that means that we will set up a season that takes historically uh, catch information and compares it to end of the season run sizes and then produces basically a weekly harvest rate. And, and so with a harvest rate, uh, if the run size comes in higher than forecasted, uh, you're still going to impact a rate, like say it's 5% total. Uh, the idea here is that it doesn't matter what the actual run size is, your catch is going to be X percent of what comes back. So you may catch more. If you use a, a quota, if the run size comes back different than your forecast, then you're either gonna catch more fish than you should have, or you actually might lose some opportunity on fish if the run is larger. Because once you hit that quota, you're done. And if you got a big return, you're gonna miss out. But if you use a rate, then the catch is going to adjust according to the run size. So we use rates and not quotas in, okay. in terminal fishery. Even with that, Five percent impact projection management. Instead. Yes, and, and I again, I'll, I'll reiterate that if we're wrong and the forecast come or the the actual return comes in larger, then you have more opportunity. Right. Okay. Thank you. And it looks like our next question is from Francis. Francis, I have um, allowed you to talk. You may need to unmute yourself. Am I there? We hear you, Francis. Okay, so uh, I've been looking at numbers like this for the last 20 years and I like to look at big picture. And the big picture I see is that we're basically fishing to the 5% on everything but chum. Although you say it, you, we have a run size on Chinook that does exceed the escapement goal. Uh, we do have uh, achievement of the achievement goal three of the previous five years, the nuts and the bolts of it is when you, when you look at it, we're basically looking at, you know, 5% available to the state share if we were to target those fish. And I can tell you right now, if we target them, we're going to overshoot because the fishing power for Chinook is just, it's, it's mind blowing what the sport fleet can do to a Chinook run in this basin, especially one with such a marginal surplus. I mean, it's really, it's right at 110%, give or take 100 fish, okay? And if you split that with the tribe, well, then it's give or take 50 fish, okay? So uh, we've, the only other time we've been in this situation where we had, you know, we're in penalty box for kings and we had a, uh, a, a really big conservation concern for coho was in 2016. Um, I push for this every year because I think it's the highest and best use of a hatchery fish. Uh, you'll hear me say it again and again at meeting after meeting after meeting that it is ridiculous to put in a reg that makes anybody have to release a hatchery fish once it comes to hand. Every one of them should be bonked if there is no conservation concern for that hatchery fish or your broodstock needs. So I'm gonna make a pitch for it again this year. And I'll tell you that, uh, it's great for conservation for two species because essentially like I said before, we're fishing on an impact for wild coho, we're fishing on an impact for uh, wild Chinook. Um, so our target species that we should be directing our fisheries at are chum and hatchery coho. So in order to get to those fish, we have limited numbers of wild kings and wild coho to get at them. Uh, 
I, I suspect we're going to be in a situation of one and done for most of the season, if not all of it. And it would be crazy to make anybody release a hatchery Chinook in this basin if it's going to get them off the water that much quicker to conserve on your wild coho and to conserve on your wild Chinook. And uh, uh, we made it happen in 2016. I was so glad that the first day I got on the water in Grays Harbor on opening day, October 1st, the first bite of the day for an old duffer that uh, I'd taken in the boat for the first time. He was a friend of another old duffer that I take all the time. He was so excited when I said, it's a king and it's missing a fin, keeper. And you should have seen the guy's face light up. I think he would have had a heart attack if I made him release that fish. But it's the only time we've ever been able to legally harvest a fish like that. It's a squandered opportunity every time we don't get to harvest a fish like that. So I, I make that push again this year. And I hope you bios will back me up on it from the standpoint of conservation. It's not just an allocation thing. And to be fair, every other fishery that gets on that basin, I'm talking about our commercial brethren, if they encounter a hatchery king, they get to keep it. So the same rules should apply for, for uh, the sports and there's absolutely no downside to it this year at all. Okay, thank you. Thank you. It looks like Melanie is has the next question. Melanie, I have allowed you to talk. Am I unmuted now? We hear you, Melanie. Wonderful, thank you. Um, um, I really wasn't gonna say anything until I heard Francis and I had to say, I agree with Francis 100%. Those fish are there for us to take and we need to take them. Just saying. That's all I had. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you. And it looks like Dave has his hand back up. Dave, I have allowed you to talk. Unmute. There. You got me? We got you, Dave. Yeah. Okay. Just for information for everybody is those hatchery Chinook and the Chehalis you're talking about have one origin. And that's the East Fork of the Satsip. They're fish that are brood stocked. And the purpose of that program is to uh, rebuild and somewhat maintain that run on the East Fork of Satsip, which in its natural state was the prime Chinook stream in the uh, Chehalis Basin. Uh, and so when you say it's clip fish, the fact is that the volunteers that did that for years refused to allow the agency to clip them just so you couldn't know the difference. And then everybody had to clip them. So when you say it's a hatchery fish, you kind of want to recognize that all hatchery fish are not the same. They're a hatchery, you mark them because you know the origin, but the purpose of those hatchery fish in the satsip is to maintain that run because if you don't, it collapses. Uh, Harry Sen in the seventies, ahead of salmon cultures, sent three crews down from then Simpson Hatchery and they could hardly find a Chinook. He, well, he was just a, too high in the river, to be honest. But the bottom line is those fish are there to maintain it. Otherwise, we go right back into that ball game that we had for years where the Satsup Chinook were the limiter in our fisheries and it knocked us, knocked us off our catch a whole bunch of times, okay? So, you know, when you, when you start thinking it's a Columbia River, you need to redo it because those, the purpose of those fish are not just to be a put and take, they're, they're to maintain a, a, a natural run that has struggled for the better part of 45, 50 years. Okay, that's it. Appreciate your thoughts, Dave. We have no other questions at this moment. If anybody else has any questions, please raise your hand.
Well, I, uh, uh, since nobody else has any questions, uh, I might just start talking here. Uh, reminder uh, to folks that we have um, our forecast meeting, uh, our big statewide meeting tomorrow. And maybe I'll pause a second and recognize Dave again. I was busy typing away. I'd click on it. I have a question for Mike. Uh, I was waiting for somebody else in the upper basin that say it, but they didn't. Um, the Springers. Um, Kurt knows where they all spawn. He doesn't like to tell you, but he knows where they all spawn. Uh, my question is, are you going to shut the entire river down for fishing like you did for the zero impact thing a bit back? Or are you going to do some other restriction that Pre that uh, protects the spring Chinook. In other words, uh, use a more targeted approach rather than a double barrel shotgun in both barrels. Okay, and that's kind of my question to you, Mike. Yep, got it. Um, you know, we, we haven't gotten that far yet. We don't know exactly what's gonna go on. Um, I think I'm going to approach it as we have most every other year is that, oh, look, we just don't have enough for a targeted fishery. Um, we've seen, we saw a couple of years of some really, really low numbers that scared everybody. We're seeing a little bit of a rebound. Uh, so at this time, I'm not sure uh, we would move forward with a total lockdown. Um, at this point, I don't, I'm not sure if it makes sense, but um, certainly that's not going to be the first thing on my plate to do. Hope, hope that helps. Um, well, it does, but I have, uh, I'd like to put one thing in there is, uh, if you're trying to catch a springer below South Monty, you might as well kind of go shoot yourself. Even the Colts don't have a whole lot of luck at it. I mean, with the, with the bloody gill net, uh, if you're going to catch springers, it's mostly going to be above South Monty, maybe around Fuller Hill a little bit, but mostly, mostly upstream from there. So if you have to go for uh, a rule change, there's no reason to be draconian about it. Now, like I just argued that we need to do days instead of like a two week window. So it's equitable. I understand that is, I, I am adamant about that. And I'm going to fight like hell for that one, Mikey. But on this one, if you have to protect the springers, Unfortunately, it is the upper basin is where these creatures reside. And there, are no, there is no way in the world to avoid them bearing the, the, the greatest share of the burden and springers, okay? Number two is we got a tiny little springer run. It's an aberration, really. Our Chinook, we have one big Chinook run. It just starts early. And then we got what we call springers. We got summers. Uh, we got falls. And we used to have a December one. They're kind of gone. So bottom line is, to me, is pretty simple, is the thought of having a springer fishery on anything that you keep is absurd because that run cannot take the pressure, okay? And that simply is. And one last thing, piece of information. Then I'm an old geezer. Um, the the Skookumchuk Dam. When that dam was put, put in, R.W. Stone and a Region 6, he was fish manager, program manager then, he argued against mitigation for springers because he said the argument, the flows with the tri-level cooling and everything would produce a vibrant recreational fishery. Now, do you say you're worried about the falls coming up? I, 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 I got you there, but you, you, you should understand is that dam is working exactly like the agency wanted it to. That is what they wanted done. Okay. So if it's causing you problems now, well, it's kind of late guys, because you, you kicked mitigation to the street aside and you went for what you got. And so I think now you just have to deal with it. All right, Dave, I did note down uh, your comments about, evaluating where and if and where shutdowns could be more effective. 
while still thing, keeping things open. And yeah, as for what happened historically, unfortunately, we can't do anything about it now. We just have to work with what we have. And, and we've learned a lot since back in the, I think it was in the seventies when they built that dam. And uh, hopefully we can get on top of some, some things that may benefit the, the species. By the way, we won't talk about the weir that was supposed to be in to keep the fall Chinook from getting to the summers, the, the spring Chinook. Just need to throw that in there so everybody knows. I don't hear anything. La, 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 la. What? I, I can't hear anything. I'm joking. Oh. Joking with you, Dave. Oh. <laughs> uh, Three dirty words. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Um, I think I saw Greg McMillan with a hand up. Yeah, you get me? We got you, Greg. Go ahead. Yeah, I, my question is, um, since uh, on the Willapaw side, since uh, the department is going to go to the commission or the commission meeting soon. Um, I was looking at the escapement numbers and and it seems like we're heavily down to the last fish at this point, you know, counting. And I was just wondering if there's been given any thought on putting some sort of asterisk or something in there, you know, on these numbers, because uh, I know particularly on the nacelle, we we had two considerable water events right when the fish were at the hatcheries and and right you know and to where the weir the weirs had went down and and um it, i was just wondering if that ever gets captured in any of these numbers um you know when you do have significant fish going over Thanks for that, Greg. I might uh, kick it to James or Jody to address that question. Yeah, we got a group of folks on here that I think can help with that. But um, I'll just I'll just let you know that we have a total number of spawners on the spawning grounds, and that includes both hatchery origin, natural origin. And so we use those two numbers for forecasting for whether or not we met escapement goals. And so, yeah, all those numbers are accounted for. And um, and I'll say when the weir goes down, you know, everybody knows about it and, and it's something, you know, we're running out there to, to try to, you know, uh, remedy. So yeah, it's a good question. And there's a couple flaws in that system, but we're working hard on it. So yeah, for us, the key is like making sure we account for it. And so we've got, you know, pretty solid documentation on what went upstream and what didn't. So. Thanks, James. Any other questions tonight? Well, again, uh, I want to thank uh, the staff from the department uh, for putting stuff together. Uh, you know, putting numbers on a screen for you guys here tonight is really easy, but there's a lot of work that goes into these forecasts. Um, a lot of digging into the details to make sure we're trying to get it right. So big hats off and thanks to all you folks. Um, just a reminder, uh, as we went through earlier, there's a forecast meeting tomorrow, statewide forecast meeting. Please feel free to, to check in. It's going to be uh, on TVW, and we'll also have it on, available on the website if you can't make it. Um, as we get through uh, into next week and the following week, that's when we're having those Pacific Fishery Management Council meetings where we're setting ocean options. So we'll get our sideboards uh, for both Chinook and Coho in the ocean fisheries and be able to start thinking about uh, our, our more terminal areas on the coast and in Puget Sound uh, and the Columbia River. Um, and the next opportunity we'll have to get back to you folks with you folks will be kind of in that middle of March uh, time period. We'll have the next North of Falcon meeting and uh, start uh, circling back with Willapaw and Grays Harbor individual um, uh, with individual meetings then. So 
Uh, with that, I might just check in with uh, James or anybody if you had any closing thoughts. James or Marlene? Yeah, no, thanks everybody for coming. Um, yeah, I wish we could be in person, so hopefully here soon. Great. Well, thanks everybody again uh, for being here, providing comments, uh, asking questions. We really appreciate your time uh, and your interest in, in what we're doing. Uh, look forward to talking to everybody again down the road and uh, everybody be safe and take care. Thanks so much.